Okay, all good? Yep. Yeah, uh, I'll go and do a little introduction as well. Um, so I'm excited to invite Dr. Karen uh, Knudsen to uh, talk with us today. Um, she earned her PhD from UC San Diego and then went on to do a postdoc at the Lud Ludwig Institute of Cancer Research. From there, she was a um, assistant and associate professor at University of Cincinnati. And then in 2007, moved to Thomas uh, Jefferson University and um, since being there, she now serves as the Executive Vice President of Oncology Services, also as the Enterprise Director of the Sydney uh, Kimmel Cancer Center, the Chair of the Department of Cancer Biology, um, also as the Hilary Kaprowski uh, Professor, and she also serves on a number of boards. Um, she serves on the Scientific Review Board for Genentech, uh, Board of Scientific Advisors for National Cancer Institute, is the President of Associate, Association of American Cancer Institute, Board of Directors for American Association for uh, Cancer Research. And while doing all of this, she also earned her MBA in uh, uh, 2019. So i um, really excited to hear uh, what you have to share with us today, Dr. Knudsen, and uh, I'll let you have the floor. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for having me. This is really a, you know, a delight for me. As I said, I wish uh, I were there in person, um, but I'm going to take this as the second best thing. And, um, you know, I have so many friends and colleagues and people that I respect at uh, Colorado. It's just, uh, it's hard not to be there because when I'm there, it's, it's kind of like going home. So all good. And uh, thank you for having me. So let me just move everybody's picture so that I can see myself and, or not see my slides. So, okay, all right, good. Um, so what I was hoping to do is to talk to you today about some, you know, longstanding work that we've had in the lab about developing actionable subtypes for prostate cancer. And I know that that's shared by other people at, at Colorado and including Dr. Kramer. And, um, you know, really, really, uh, interested in pushing that forward for the field. It's an area for which we have not had as much success as we would like. And what I want to focus on today is on RB deficient uh, cancers, and in particular, RB deficient adenocarcinomas. So as you heard about, I do a few things outside the lab, but none of them have any bearing on today's uh, research. So I do want to say a couple of things about why prostate cancer. And I know you have so many experts where you are that you, you know this disease type in and out, but I wanted to give you kind of my perspective of, of uh, why I'm in Philadelphia working on this right now. So I wanna give you just a brief intro to, to my world, uh, which is I'm you know, over here in, in Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Uh, and we serve patients in our cancer program that are from these seven counties four in Pennsylvania and three in New Jersey. Uh, and within that catchment area, we have a very high cancer incidence, high cancer mortality, and this incredibly dense heterogeneous population. And just to give you an, an appreciation for scale, if we were a state, if these seven counties were a state that we serve, we would be the number 25 state in terms of density of population. So we've got a lot going on here in the seven counties for us to handle in terms of how it is that we address the cancer problem. This is the cancer incidence data I was talking about. So just a heat map of uh, cancer incidence per 100,000 residents. I'm just highlighting what used to be our four catchment areas. We've now added these three counties in red because of our expansion. And what you can see is that compared to the rest of the state, or the rest of the nation, we really have a significant cancer problem for cancer incidence. But it's not just cancer incidence, it's also cancer mortality. So of all of the data that my team and I look at regularly, this one at the Cancer Center is probably the most important. So what we've um, put together is on the left cancer incidence and on the right cancer mortality, rates per 100,000 residents for the nation, for the state of Pennsylvania, for the state of New Jersey, and then in our seven county catchment area. And in red is where we outpace either the states, the nation, or both. So just from the magnitude of red, you can say, okay, this region, these seven counties have a problem, but not all problems are, are uh, proportionate to each other. Prostate cancer is a major issue. So you can see already that in our catchment area, prostate cancer incidence exceeds uh, Pennsylvania, exceeds the nation by quite a lot in terms of incidence. 
this isn't always a bad thing. Uh, prostate cancer incidents can mean that you're screening for it and that you're finding it. But where it really becomes a problem is in issues like this, where the mortality far exceeds both states and the nation. So it's one of the reasons that our cancer center has such a high focus on prostate cancer from both the fundamental, the uh, genetics perspective, as well as for new interventions for care. We got a lot of issues of cancer disparities within our cancer center, but the largest disparity that's associated with race and ethnicity is actually prostate cancer. So if we look at African-Americans versus whites in our seven counties, the mortality, age-adjusted mortality is really significant for uh, African-Americans versus whites. And we don't know the answer behind that, but it is one of the reasons why we set up the first uh, in the US men's genetic risk clinic uh, within Philadelphia, because what much of what we know for about genetic risk for prostate cancer is associated with whites of uh, European descent. So we're really hoping to take that heterogeneous population that we serve and use the genetic risk clinic to benefit the patients, but also to understand more fully what are some of the additional risk factors which may drive that high incidence and high mortality in our region. So, when it comes to actually studying various attributes of the disease, you know, like you, we have people who are, are looking across the prostate cancer continuum. But where my lab's focus really has been, has been in the patient who develops or presents with non-organ confined disease. And that is because the patient who actually has organ confined disease has a high expectation of cure through either, either radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy. So as I said, we've been really interested in this individual. Uh, and as I know you may know from the excellent work that happens at Colorado is that the mainstay of therapy for patients with advanced disease, with disseminated prostate cancer is to antagonize a nuclear receptor. That nuclear receptor being the, the androgen receptor. We know that androgen receptor function is required for prostate cancer development and progression. And it is the first line therapeutic target for any patient with metastatic disease. And we can talk about this if you want, but I suspect you already know from your groups at Colorado that this is achieved through a couple of different ways that are now increasingly used in combination, especially after last month's ASCO-GU. So this is intended to either deprive the androgen receptor of its ligand through androgen deprivation or castration-based uh, therapies, uh, or to utilize a direct androgen receptor antagonists. Now, successful antagonism of the androgen receptor results in a reduction in cell growth, cell survival, and DNA repair pathways that are promoted by AR. And these are effective in the vast majority of patients. But what we do know is that this is transient and that this remission that occurs is, uh, is durable for only about two to three years median time, after which there's a relapse and castrate resistant prostate cancer forms. And the hallmark of castrate resistant prostate cancer is that it, it still expresses androgen receptor target genes and the androgen receptor has been reactivated. Now there's a lot of emphasis on this stage of disease because this is a stage at which there has been no durable cure. And one of the things that we have been chasing down for the last many years in this has to do with the role of the RB pathway in this process. When we look in the clinical setting, we know that at this stage of disease, even now with widespread metastasis, and we can say this because we just completed a clinical trial with Maha Hussein a couple of years ago, we're and just actually uh, published the paper <laughs> last week in clinical cancer research, is that we've actually been able to profile. So there really is very low incidence uh, to almost, you don't want to use the word undetectable, but almost undetectable incidence of RB loss or RB dysfunction at the stage of metastatic disease. Rather, this occurs in this transition to castrate resistance and up to, four, depending on the study, up to 40% of patients who, with castrate resistant disease have tumors where there's RB loss of function. And we've been able to show, and we'll talk about this, that that actually is a driver alteration. So RB deficiency on its own is sufficient to drive castrate resistant disease. So from the clinical perspective, and, and if you will, the clinical need perspective, we know standing here today in 2021, that metastatic disease is a uniformly fatal uh, transition if it's gone to castrate resistance. We have few clinically actionable subtypes. Um, that might be generous. We really have one-ish 
which is a, a cohort of DNA repair alterations for which there's been um, fast track designation for use of PARP inhibitors. But clearly we need to do better because all of the therapies that we've thrown at advanced prostate cancer ultimately are evaded largely through AR reactivation or through transition to a, a neuroendocrine phenotype. So we posed the question, given the role of RB in castrate-resistant disease, whether or not it actually is an actionable subtype and have devoted energy to try to understand the implications of RB loss. So some of these studies were initially headed by Chris McNair, who had been a postdoc or graduate student in the lab and has gone on uh, with his expertise in bioinformatics to actually uh, uh, elevate through the system and is our associate director for data science. Really incredible double threat individual who is exceptional in the lab as he is in um, coding. And so really a phenomenal set of work that helped us understand RB. So you'll recall that RB does its job as a tumor suppressor through transcriptional repression. So loss of RB should lead to an induction of a gene expression network that's normally repressed by the tumor suppressor at the easiest outset. So early on, many years ago in the, in the early aughts, there was some investigation into what an RB loss signature might look like, largely using mouse tissue. So kind of not, not as tightly tied to the human scenario, but very um, useful at the time and based on microarrays. So using some of those early data, even then, we could see that high representation of the RB loss signature was associated with an earlier time to recurrence in men who initially were thought to have been successfully treated for prostate cancer. So this is the first indication that we had that, it, that, prof, that RB loss was associated with poor outcome. Now we since enriched um, that signature uh, with the, through collaboration with Felix Fang at UCSF by looking at signature of loss for dual copy RB loss. Now there is haploinsufficiency of RB in many tumor types, including prostate, but just for simplicity, in this study, this one was really baked around tumors that have really truly lost from a genomics perspective, two copies of the RB gene um, using a, a 951 uh, cancer cell line training set. We were able to, to drill down and come up with 186 genes set that we felt could faithfully across tumor types represent 100% RB loss. And when we take those data and then we apply them to situations where we know the outcome, uh, we can observe that this RB loss signature is indicative and indeed uh, predicts for uh, earlier time to progression to reduce disease specific survival and indeed reduced overall survival. So I, I think these data tell us that it's quite important to know functionally what RB loss is contributing to the tumor phenotype irrespective of outside prostate, although we have largely conf confined our studies uh, there to date we do intend to expand out. So worth understanding is that those signatures are all baked around two copy RB loss. But if you go back to your you know, textbook version of the cell cycle, you'll know there are a lot of ways to lose RB. In prostate cancer, however, that doesn't really hold up. So if we look across a large number of data sets, and I'm just showing you, you know, a couple here for ease of castrate resistant disease, and you benchmark incidence in tumor types compared to the most frequent genetic alteration, AR amplification, what you see is that loss of at least one or two copies of the RB gene itself is the most frequent alteration. And that other alterations that are really common in other tumor types like breast cancer where amplification of CDK4 or cyclin B is common really doesn't occur in prostate cancer. And important to know is that these, let's call them bad genetic events can happen in the same patient. So these are just some of those you know, standard um, plots looking in, at individual patients in a vertical column. And RB loss with AR amplification is not uncommon. But useful for us to know as we go through the model that loss of the RB gene itself, single or dual copy loss is generally the way that RB loss is, is uh, attained. Now, what happens if you have a single copy? We investigated this several years ago with Pete Nelson in some of the LUCAP series, as well as investigating um, castrate resistant tumors at autopsy. And what we noted is in tumors that retained a single wild type copy of RB, many of them expressed no detectable protein and a significant number of them expressed no transcript. 
So really important for us to know is that looking at RB status from our perspective is probably best done by immunohistochemistry um, because the genomics can, can paint a picture for us that's confusing about how much RB has been lost. Now, one would say back to your same textbook with the cell cycle that all of this totally makes sense. Karen, you know, this is as simple as it gets. You lose RB, you deregulate the cell cycle, and your tumor grows faster, and that should make a more aggressive tumor. Except that has very little evidence or, you know, bearing in evidence in the clinical setting. And that's even beyond prostate cancer that are adenocarcinomas. In the neuroendocrine-like setting, RB loss is strongly associated with a higher proliferative index. But in tumors that have a neuro, or an, an uh, adenocarcinoma-like phenotype, uh, less apparent in the clinical setting. And we're writing this up in, in a review article right now. But it's also the case that we and others, uh, Johan de Bono as well, um, have published that looking at the KI67 index as a function of RB status, whether you look by genomics or whether you look by AHC, they have no relevance with each other. So put simply, RB loss by itself is simply not inducing a high proliferative tumor. So then what's the problem? What is the advantage? If the tumor is going to the, to the trouble to delete one or maybe two copies of RB, why? And so our approach to that had been to take a large number of isogenic pairs um, from human models to deplete RB and then ask what is the impact from a molecular standpoint as well as from a cellular standpoint. And there's a really beautiful, if you're interested in all the things that, are, that RB has been tentatively tied to, um, largely in model systems, it's a great review from Nick Dyson that talks about all of the different cellular pathways that RB is associated with um, outside cell cycle control. And so which of any of these are the most important for prostate was our most proximal question. So without going into great detail of history, these very old experiments in the lab kind of tell the story also of what we should have predicted when we looked at uh, clinical prostate cancers that have lost RB. So if you take isogenic pairs, and again, I'm just gonna show you one for example, and you deplete RB in vitro or in vivo, it's really unremarkable. There is no discernible growth advantage and others have seen this as well until you castrate. So once you castrate the animals, there starts to be an, uh, an advantage of RB deficiency that leads to a shorter time to biochemical failures or PSA doubling time of those tumors. And at the time when we did these studies, which is in the pre-CHIP-seq era, we could identify each of binding sites in the AR regulatory locus that we knew to be at least in part driving this castrate resistant phenotype in that E2F binds to the, both the promoter and enhancer regions of AR uh, and enhances the amount of receptor that's made. If we compromise this, we compromise the transition to castrate resistance. Uh, but this by no means was in, indicative of the fact that this is the only way that, that RB loss and E2F gain are driving castrate resistant disease. What was interesting for us at the time is if we profiled again, individual human metastatic tumors those tumors that were low or had no RB had the highest levels of AR expression, as well as E2F1, which is an E2F1 regulated gene. E2F regulates itself. So this gave us some of our first indication of a preliminary model that we thought we needed to chase down so we could understand RB even more fully. And the, the model we were laboring under is that AR positive uh, prostate cancer is almost invariably RB positive until it sees castration. And that that castration challenge can be overcome through RB loss, we consider that a driver alteration, that results in an upregulation of both E2F1 and AR, both E2F target genes, that somehow triggers gene networks which lead to castrate resistance. So we have been really interested in answering these two questions over the last several years, which is what's the genome-wide impact on AR and E2F1, and what's the mechanism of progression? So you would think that this uh, would be the easiest of all experiments that had been done in the field. But what's really interesting about the RB field is it doesn't always consider itself a transcription field. So although RB does its job as a transcriptional repressor, we could find no evidence that in the literature that someone had done the simplest of all experiments, which is to just take model systems, delete out or deplete RB. 
and look at a genome-wide scale for E2F1 binding. And so this is uh, some of the first studies that we, we think um, that had done this, at least in the human model system. And this is done by Chris McNair and published a couple of years ago. So what was really interesting about this is you can look at the forest plots or the Venn diagrams, we can just look at the forest plots, is that there's an expansion of E2F function of new E2F1 binding sites that were not present in the RB intact setting. E2F binding sites that are present in the E2F1 uh, or in the RB intact setting that become even more, uh, you know, they're strengthened, if you will, in the absence of RB. And then a small number that I'm going to admit we have not followed up that only exist and are lost in the uh, in the only exist in the RB intact setting and are lost in the in the uh, RB uh, deficient setting. So what these data suggested to us is that in general E2F function is retained when you lose RB, but its capacity is expanded and that there's an expanded cisrome. An interesting component looking at that even more deeply is that where we, we normally think of E2F as binding at promoters and our data would support that, although it's, it's about 50%, so you know, close, um, is that in the RB depleted scenario, there was a, by percentage much more E2F binding at what are likely enhancer regions through distal energetic and intronic areas and new motifs that are gained um, upon RB loss. And these are, it contain a number of potential Co cooperating transcription factors that could assist E2F in, in driving protumergenic um, gene networks. And one that I'm not going to talk about today, but we're pretty excited about, and we're just finishing up writing the paper right now, is uh, AR. Uh, AR half sites is emerging with E2F1, and the potential for those two oncogenic transcription factors in prostate cancer to cooperate turns out to have some really interesting observations associated with it. So a story for another day. Um, but most importantly, when we took this, uh, you know, these, these new genes that were specifically turned on in RB loss and the isogenic pairs, and then tried to ascribe potential E2F regulation of these genes using a guilty by association approach and a 30 kV window on either side of saying this has a potential to be E2F1 regulated, then that, I'm sorry, my mouse is very sensitive and I'm getting used to it. The, um, the, the gene set of this expanded E2F1 signature in human data sets was able to pick out which are the CRPCs, which are RB deficient, and have lost a single or double copy of RB. So we're looking very carefully at that signature uh, functionally to assess which of these are really driving the aggressive phenotypes and the poor outcome associated with RB. So, so those in those published studies, really what we what we thought we had gained is that. We know RB loss. We knew RB loss could be a driver. When we look at those that became castrate resistant because they lost RB, we saw that E2F1 was rewired to enhancers. There was an upregulation of AR. We've known that already. There's AR E2F1 cooperation story for a different day. And what I didn't get a chance to tell you, but it's in that, that published paper, is that some of those transcriptional networks that are induced are very strongly um, pro metastatic, and we believe that these are likely what are driving the poor outcomes associated with that disease. But what about this group? So we knew from looking at, although small, a series of longitudinal studies that there are tumors that achieve castrate resistance through other mechanisms, of course, like amplification of AR, and then subsequently lose RB. And so our query was, is that meaningful? Does that add additional benefit? You're already castrate resistant. So does losing RB add a benefit or is it just a, a passenger effect? And so, uh, a very brave graduate student who will be defending shortly, um, Amy Mandigo, took this on. And she compared her cohorts, or a number of cohorts, of uh, tumors, tumor cell lines that became castrate, resistance through, castrate resistant through RB loss versus those that had already become castrate resistant in green. And then subsequently, we modeled out uh, RB deficiency. And so she again took those same genome-wide approaches, and you'll see some of the same logical thinking go through. And what she saw really surprised me. So in the RNA-seq assessment, again, she has these two different cohorts, those that have achieved castrate resistance through RB loss or those that were castrate resistant and then lost RB. So in the RNA-seq analysis, she saw some commonality, but also some significant differences. And so what we focused on was this cohort of gene networks here, about 100, uh, 1,872 genes that are specifically increased after RB loss in tumors that are already castrate resistant. 
And then we cross compared that with the cisterone studies for E2F1. Again, we're in E2F1 in the, in the castrate resistance setting showed distinctions in binding as if compared to those tumors for which E2F was rewired uh, as a function of that transition to castrate resistance. Um, and so when we look at these, what we saw was very different types of co you know, very different, very similar profile of, of areas of binding in the genome. But it's the case that we saw different cofactors enriched, whereas NF1, AR were, you know, deeply embedded in, in that first grouping when tumor cells became castrate resistant through RB loss. In this, where they're castrate resistant already and you lose RB, now you come up with the four kids. And so what that means is something that we're still, uh, you know, discerning of how is this really controlled? Um, what's regulating these novel E2F1 binding sites uh, in the different two different disease states or disease stages, if you will? And what is the contribution of the 4 uh, proteins toward these positioning of E2F1 is, is something we're going to tackle. Um, I should mention that the rest of this story was just, uh, public, just uh, accepted for publication earlier this week um, in Cancer Discovery. So we're, we're pretty excited about um, being able to share this story more widely as well. So what uh, Amy did is she took those same overlay of the cisterone binding, the RNA-seq analysis, and used the same guilty by association approach, a gene that's upregulated specific to um, castrate resistant cells that had lost RB, and then a, a new E2F1 binding site within a 30 kb window, plus minus a transcription site or a transcriptional start site. What she saw functionally was again quite distinct from that earlier stage of disease in that the majority of pathways that she saw enriched were associated with cell metabolism. So when we actually look uh, at those, we could, we could validate all of these at the, at the RNA and at the protein level and also beyond prostate. So in breast cancer cells as well, we could see this same upregulation of genes associated with metabolic signaling. Now, um, this is where things started to get, uh, uh, you know, really interesting. And instead of just cherry picking those pathways, what Amy um, elected to do, which I think was really the right thing, was to engage in some widespread or wide scale uh, metabolomics, the so whole scale metabolomics. So uh, in doing those assessments, what she saw very similar to her transcriptional profile is that the major pathways that were, that were altered um, when you look at, at metabolites uh, downstream of RB loss in this late stage of disease were associated with lipid and amino acid metabolism. So what we elected to do then was to do some cross comparison of all of these. So the new E2F1 binding sites, new genes in this uh, stage of disease and new metabolites. And where do those intersect? Gave us seven pathways associated with amino acid and lipid metabolism. This still is a lot to discern of what it is that we wanted to really focus on. And I'm just showing you the city plot of amino acid metabolism to show you all of the things that were changed. So in red, these were all genes that were changed in response to RB loss specific to the stage of disease. Uh, and then the metabolites are shown for you, which we had confirmed in all of the in intervening boxes. And through an iterative process of trying to understand which of these may help explain RB the impact of RB loss in, in association with poor outcome, we uh, really focused on glutathione metabolism. And I'm just gonna spend the rest of the time talking to you about that. I'm gonna tell you this was not my area of comfort zone when Amy said, we're gonna study glutathione metabolism, but she was right in pushing us that way. There's a lot of data. Um, that led up to just even this one figure. So I'm going to summarize it for you here. In that, in red, these are all transcripts associated with glutathione synthesis that were upregulated specific to this stage of disease. And blue are the altered metabolites associated with that pathway. And they, those metabolites went in the direction that you would expect. So for example, if uh, you know, cystathione goes down because CTH is upregulated and is ex expediting that conversion to cysteine, if that makes sense. So all of them went in the right direction. And I'll give you an example of that later. But interesting, and of course, we were all the time going back and looking at this at the transcript level and validating, but also seeing that this was occurring in breast cancer cells as well. 
So if we looked at those novel binding sites and some of the key um, pathways or key transcripts that were upregulated by E2F1, we could identify novel uh, peaks there that were likely driving some of these events and also validate them by E2F1 chip. And I'm just giving you an example here of some of the ones that we think are the most important, but of course, many more occur in the paper. So what about functionally when it comes to glutathione uptake? So we started up here with glutamine uptake. As you'll see in green, those cells that have been depleted of RB and are isogenic pairs of those in gray show a significant upregulation of glutamine uptake uh, just by RB loss itself. And we can uh, really satisfy ourselves that this is really true to the up as, as a result of the up to increase in uptake by using uh, GPNA, which suppresses glu the glutamine transport process. So we felt pretty positive about that. If we also look at the end of the pathway of total glutathione, again, in those pairs, all of those that have uh, become RB deficient increase the amount of total glutathione that is produced. So all these parts of the pathway seem to come together. And this is E2F1 dependent. So if we look at all of these different uh, enzymes that are E2F1 regulated, again, I'm so sorry about my mouse, that are E2F1 regulated in the light green, we can suppress that, that induction of gene expression through E2F1 um, depletion. And these have to be done transiently. Our model systems cannot handle uh, or survive a durable uh, depletion of E2F1, but in a transient mechanism, they can. Um, and in this case, also total glutathione increased by RB uh, loss is uh, reduced when E2F1 is suppressed in these transient studies. So by all stretches of, of measure, we believe that the, the data tell us that this increased glutathione after RB loss appears to be E2F1 dependent. So functionally, what does that mean uh, if from, in terms of cancer phenotypes? So glutathione does a lot, we all know that. One of the things that we observed when we were assessing these model systems is that glutathione has a major role in suppressing reactive oxygen species that occur uh, downstream of chemotherapeutic or radiotherapy insult and is actually important for death, cell death in response to chemotherapy or IR. And in fact, uh, what we could observe is that uh, RB loss just protects against um, intracellular uh, ROS. And so uh, it, it's the case that we challenge this as well by looking at the response of these RB deficient cells to doxorubicin, um, as well as radiotherapy, which I just didn't get a chance to show you. But in multiple model systems, it appears as though RB loss protects against this generation of, of ROS that is important for uh, cell death downstream of chemotherapy. So to summarize a large component of data, um, what, what we think is happening upon RB loss and castrate resistant tumors is that there is an up, uptick in these key uh, either transporters of glutamine or enzymes important for glutathione production that allow for a more rapid glutamine uptake uh, a, a more, uh, you know, a fast track, if you will, through the glutamine, um, the glutamine synthesis pathway, and an increase in the total glutathione um, that's produced by these cells. This results in a significant reduction in intracellular ROS. I should have mentioned that's at the baseline. Also, if we induce ROS uh, in through artificial means or pharmacologic means, we also see that RB reduction, RB loss reduces the amount of ROS which accumulates. And this is tightly associated with a resistance to cell death by chemotherapy and by radiotherapy. So one of our reviewers also um, said, okay, well, this is terrific. Does this mean that there's a way to target RB deficient tumors? And can you use GPNA or Rastin to see if the, there's a potential to target these pathways? And so, in fact, with GPNA, and we, we'd already talked a little bit about this one, uh, targets glutamine uptake, and Rastin is you know, relatively similar in its ability to target some of these earlier parts of glutathione production. And in each of um, these pathways, both the Rastin as well as uh, BSO, which is a, a essentially the, the same agent, is able to um, significantly significantly impact these RB deficient cells and reduce cell viability. So, you know, early days, but, you know, an interesting concept of can you take an RB deficient tumor and target it 
by suppressing uh, key components of glutamine uptake or glutathione production. So an interesting area we'll be pursuing. We could see that this increase in glutathione metabolism occurred also in vivo. I didn't want you to think this is an in vitro only uh, study. Um, in that in vivo, we saw this uptake in to total glutathione from xenograft models. Um, the, the key uh, transcriptional mechanisms by which this is occurring were conserved. And we could also see induction in some of those key uh, uh, pathways on the way to glutathione production along the way. So it appeared to happen in vivo as well. But some of the more exciting data were from looking also in the clinical setting. So looking in, in publicly available data sets for metastatic prostate cancer, for which there are not as many as we would like to look at transcriptional outcomes, we could see a significant association between E2F and some of these key components of glutathione production that were unveiled as part of the study. Um, at least one of them we could also see as relevant for breast cancer. But I think the more uh, exciting studies really were these. So these were longitudinal studies that we were able to assess with the collaboration of Johan de Bono in the UK, looking at patients who had RB intact, castrate resistant disease, that ultimately progressed then into an RB deficient tumor type. And prior to RB loss, there was really no correlation between E2F1 expression and some of these key uh, enzymes or transporters that are important for glutathione production. And that after RB loss, there was a significant association with these as well. So this uh, altered glutathione metabolism in vitro, in vivo, and also in the clinical setting appears to be specific to the RB deficient uh, tumor type. So what we think these data are telling us is that there is an advantage to losing RB, even if tumor cells have become castrate resistant through other means, and that a key component of this uh, is associated with this increase in glutamine uptake, an enhancement in total glutathione production, protection from, uh, from ROS, and therefore resistance to cytotoxic therapies that are of utility in advanced prostate cancer. So what we are trying to do at this moment is to take these two different tumor types and develop clinical trials that are uh, specific for each stage of the disease. And in fairness, you know, this clinical trial was in play before we had these data intact. We have a trial that's about to report out on um, the Abikabazi study that is specific for tumors that are AR positive um, and RB low, and that these tumors may be specifically uh, sensitive to A chemotherapy, a cabazitaxel through, through mechanisms we can talk about, but also for this uh, stage of disease where it's possible to prevent RB loss, we hope, uh, or to retain RB function, if you will, and castrate resistant disease before um, they lose RB through CDK4-6 inhibitors uh, in combination with enzalutamide. And this trial is ongoing. The idea here is to keep RB engaged as long as possible and prevent this uh, glutamine uh, uptake and glutathione production. Based on the data we have, we're of course thinking about trials that uh, target the metabolic pathway. Uh, and those are uh, early days, so nothing uh, dramatic really there to say yet or of importance to say there yet. So um, with that, I think uh, I've thanked my uh, collaborators along the way. And I just want to, again, highlight Amy, who's done all the heavy lifting on the um, glutathione and, uh, and RB loss story, which I think really adds a new dimension to our understanding of the role of RB loss in uh, prostate cancer, as well as potentially other cancers. So I also would like to thank the funders of the NCI, as well as the Prostate Cancer Foundation, um, who helped to fund these studies. And uh, for all of you, and I'm really happy to uh, have some time to take questions. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, so I was wondering, uh, so it really seems like the steps in which RB is lost uh, play a really big role on this glutathione story. Um, and so I was wondering if uh, if you check to see what the inverse is. So um, what I mean by that is what are the alterations that happen in the C42 cells? And if you lose RB and then look at the loss of those alterations, do you still see um, this uh, upregulation of the, the FOXED proteins. 
So are you thinking, does it matter how the cells become castrate resistant before they lose RV? Could that impact? Yeah, so we've right. looked, we looked at, at multiple lineages. So I don't think it's particular to just the C42 scenario because LM95, for example, same situation and the breast cancer cells we looked at, same situation and they don't go through a castrate resistance mechanism, although they, you know, they clearly can become estrogen receptor resistant. So I don't think it's that. Um, you know, I think what's really intriguing to me kind of toward your question is what's driving it from a molecular standpoint. So why is it that in those cells that become castrate resistant through RB loss, there's a preference for enrichment of, you know, a different cohort of transcription factors compared to if you've already become castrate resistant and there seems to be this real enrichment of box head, like what's controlling that process? is a really interesting one that we don't have a handle on yet, but it's it's in the hands of a postdoc at this moment. Thank you. Um, it looks like uh, Philip Owens has a question. Hey, thanks Hi. Uh, for a wonderful talk. I'm not an RB expert at all. And when the Stand Up to Cancer group came out with the PNAS update in 2019, I, I found it really striking about the RB survival benefit. So it's really cool to see that there's more coming. And I look forward to reading this paper about the progression. And I really enjoy the TCGA data set sort of inferring and guiding. For my own interests in bone, I found it really interesting that if you broke the patients because they were really non-overlapping, and when you look at the bone RB loss versus the liver RB loss versus the lymph node, the other metastatic sites, it's really different and I was just sort of interested while you were talking and I just sort of asked the question, it was like this AR amplification versus RB. And it seems very, very, like they're very different diseases in a different setting. And I think that plays along to survival of liver meds versus survival with bone disease. Have you guys thought about that in sort of potential mechanism, especially I would think metabolically, a androgen positive prostate cancer surrounded by sclerotic bone versus a liver met, which might have a completely different metabolic disease pattern. Yeah, I love this question. And I really feel like this is where the field has to go, right? Because clinically, we know someone who comes in with liver mets is gonna have a problem, right? And almost everybody's got bone mets at some point in time, but liver is bad, and why? And so we unfortunately don't have the greatest models to assess liver metastases versus bone metastases for prostate cancer. And I think that holds back the field. Um, definitely a novel area of investigation. When it comes to RB, there's also that issue that we don't have enough data sets where we can pull out soft tissue from bone. So we're trying to rectify this a little bit ourselves. So in the Abby Kabazi study, that study required a, a metastatic biopsy for all patients because entry into the study required that you we understood the RB um, pathway, or RB status. It's also the case for the Rybox study. You had to be RB positive actually to get into that study because it's a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So we have all of this tissue now for which we know the RB status. For liver mets, it's relatively easy to do um, you know, more analysis of the RB pathway because we can do so much more biochemically versus bone, which is much more prevalent, but difficult to work with from the tissue. That said, we're trying to learn as much as we can about the various roles of RB in the different tumor types. It's just bone has been really difficult for us to work with biochemically. I don't know if that's something you, you run into, but uh, just in terms of the tissue that we acquire back out, it's difficult to, for example, um, you know, try to do something like a, like a chip seek for AR or for E2F1. I, I just, I won't, <laughs> I can talk to you on a sidebar about another time, but we, we've overcome a lot of the problems of our clinical samples of bone using a lot of nanostring probe technology because it doesn't require as much enzymatic activities of polymerases and other things. It's more of a direct mm. probe measurement. So we've, we've, uh, We've done and published, and Pete Nelson, I think, is getting ready to publish his nanostring data set on metastatic prostate cancer soon. And there's another group at OHSU in Portland that's doing stuff with bone and nanostring. The, the sort of direct probe digital measurement 
because you're right, the bone, you just really can't do a lot of things that require polymerases and sequencing. It just, it's not a good place to be, so. <laughs> yeah, it's a struggle. And if we also go back and we just say, okay, well, we'll use the databases, right? For people who've already gone through and done transcriptional profiling, you know, there's, there's just not a good enough representation of the different sites in order to pick the data apart and say, you know, is, is RB reflecting this glutathione production, let's say, in bone, but not liver or liver, but not bone. We, we'd love to be able to answer those questions. So yeah, we should definitely sidebar. The other thing- I really I appreciate you going to the breast because of that, right? Like you need that additional validation because you're right, it just doesn't exist if you only look at AR positive prostate cancer. It's sad. It's a, you know, like as, as prevalent as prostate is, we're kind of um, tissue poor, right? When it comes to, to assessment of some of the tumors we'd like to look at. But the other thing I would say that we may want to talk about, which would be exciting, is we actually have a bone bank. We have a bone biorepository that's funded by Janssen for breast and prostate metastatic bone disease um, because we have an orthopedics hospital and they were just incinerating the tissue. And so we were able to arrange for Janssen to let us bank it. So we have it frozen. Um, you know, we have some in... Uh, in paraffin from each of those, but we get a large amount of tissue. Yeah, I'm definitely happy to <laughs> take up more time specifically bone. It's something we've worked through a lot on our Colorado samples and we've made a lot of great progress. And like I said, I know specifically West bias of Pete Nelson at Fred Hutch and the bunch of great folks at OHSU in Portland have also taken their bone samples to get a lot of great data, you know, but you're right, you know, if you're going to look at chip and actual transcriptional complexes, I, I don't have an easy answer. <laughs> it's painful. It's painful because that's what we want to do, right? Versus like, you know, Jake Harrell and the breast scenario has done it so beautifully because they have soft tissue and soft tissue for us is just so hard to get. I see Scott shaking his head, like, you know, we don't yeah. want the patients to have liver mets, but we'd like to have some soft tissue mets to work with, right? I, I feel like it's a bad, honest scientific method. It's like we compared prostate lymph node mets to liver mets. And it's like, but there's so many bones. It's like we had really good tissue from liver and lymph node, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Welcome to my world. So, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, I, I got a question. Um, nice talk, by the way. I really enjoyed it. It's great to hear you talk again. Um, 